Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Good evening, and thank you for joining the NOFA Summer Conference. We hope that you're enjoying the conference so far. Today, uh, we're going to be featuring a conversation about holistic homestead apple orcharding. Um, Jack Mastriani will be our presenter, and he will be discussing the fundamentals of site selection, variety, and rootstock selection, planting, nourishing, and pruning. He'll also cover the four main apple pests and how to make peace with them. I don't know if that's possible, Jack, but I'm, I'm looking forward to you, <laughs> you telling me how to do that. <laughs> um, there will also be a review of grafting techniques and his top 10 list of must-have varieties. Jack is the co-president of NOFA's Interstate Council, and he's been on the board of NOFA New Hampshire for many years. And as you might suspect, He's a card-carrying member of the uh, Apple Addicts Anonymous team. <laughs> so, uh, so tonight's workshop will be interactive with intermittent questions. Um, because Jack's broken it up into four sections, we'll take a pause between each section so you can go ahead and ask questions. I'm going to be your moderator tonight, and I'm joined at the controls by NOFA Maths, Mass's Equity Director, Anna Mohammed. Thank you to our many sponsors. So here are all of our gold sponsors. Um, and then here are all of our silver sponsors who generously are supporting our conference. So thank you to all of them. All right, so uh, welcome everyone. I'm gonna talk about uh, starting the Homestead Organic Apple Orchard and uh, sharing success. I've been doing it for, uh, I, I guess I've had the orchard for about 20 years and uh, grew some apples before that as well. And um, I had made lots of mistakes. <laughs> so I'm gonna share my learning from that as well as things that I've done very well. So a little bit of background. I'm in Southwest New Hampshire, about 970 feet on the side of a hill that does not get much rain in the summer. Um, extremely dry summer microclimate right here. Two miles away, there's twice as much rain. So I, I deal with a, a, a very dry summer, believe it or not. And uh, about 35 trees. And uh, I've tailored this talk to, to people that have anywhere between 10 and 25, 50 trees, or just someone that wants to grow an orchard but doesn't have one yet. Um, so you could either just be thinking about it or have an orchard already, and this information should be, should be helpful. Okay. Uh, it's, it's very important for, for us, and, and certainly in my experience with starting our orchard, that you think about your, your mission or, or purpose. So, you know, what is the purpose of your orchard? So, my, my wife and I, as, as partners in the, in the orchard and on the farm here, um, we talk about this and we produce this statement. And I would encourage every one of you to, to really think about uh, what the purpose of your orchard is going to be. And that's where it all starts. And then also some principles. So the principles that we put in place, we wanted to have, and I would encourage you, even if you just want to have 10 trees, you know, think about three early season um, and then maybe four mid season and three late season. Uh, you want to have apples that mature at different times so they don't all come in at once. And that's the beauty of apples is you can get, so for example, a pristine apple tree, which is the best early season tasting variety I've ever had. And it even keeps for a little while. That matures around uh, August 15th. And then you can have other varieties um, like um, uh, some of the golden delicious and, and its relatives, they don't really mature until late October. Uh, things like Gold Rush, for instance. Now, we wanted to min minimize maintenance and time as well. So we really thought that, uh, you know, there's other things that we do. We don't want to spend all day long every day in the orchard. Um, so I'm going to be presenting to you some, some tips on how to minimize maintenance and time. Uh, we have mostly semi-dwarf uh, some, and, and some standard rootstock. And the last bullet was important for us as a principle. Uh, we place a lot greater value on, on a few good apples versus just production. And that's the good thing about having a homestead orchard is if you're not 
you know, selling apples for a living, um, it allows you to thin more vigorously, to prune a little bit harder, um, and, and that will produce better quality apples for some reasons I'll give. So principles, purpose and principles, that's where it all starts. A homestead orchard, I'm defining as certainly no more than 50 trees, uh, maybe 10 or 15. And it's, it's not a source of income. You know, we don't sell any apples. We, we give away apples. We give away cider. Uh, last year was a boom year. And we gave uh, a lot of cider away. <laughs> it's, it's almost as if you know, anybody that came by our house, I'd stop them in the middle of the road and say, hey, you, you, you've got you to gotta have some of the cider. Uh, we made so much of it because we didn't have enough room to store it all. Uh, so... Home structure to me is not making a living from, from selling apples, but using them, friends, family, and for your own purposes. Uh, benefits of a homestead orchard, it's a scale. Smaller scale, smaller equip equipment. You, you can experiment, you can make mistakes, that's fine. And there's some wonderful non-commercial varieties that you can uh, try that are have wonderful flavors and uh, we've done that here um, so i, I have uh, about 30 7, 38 trees and i have 35 different varieties um, even more now because I, i've been grafting different varieties on, on some of the on some of the trees okay um this is important for, for anyone, and I believe uh, it has to do with our climate extremes that we have um, now more than ever. And it's called the biennial boogie. So this is something I've noticed that's increasing rather than decreasing over time, is that we tend to have boom years and bust years with the apple trees in our apple crop. Last year was a boom year. 2017 was a boom year. 2015 was a boom year. 2016, 2018 were busts. Not a lot of apples. This year, 2020, is mostly a bust for us, mostly. I and mean, we do have some trees that have quite a few apples, but we have more trees that have no apples at all. And I think it has to do with um, extreme variations, especially in, in, in winter, in our winters and in our springs. Um, we typically are into um, a climate regime now where we have a lot of mild falls. So the September, Octobers are warmer than normal. And then November, it can get cold very suddenly and very hard. Uh, late November, and, and that doesn't allow the trees a chance to harden off well. And then we, we have tended to have generally uh, milder winters than normal, although huh, we've had some very extremely cold winters. Winter of 2014, 2015 was one of the coldest in almost 100 years. So, you know, it's not like everything. It's not like we're growing palm trees anytime soon. Uh, but then, and then the springs have been very chilly. So, um, you know, that uh, can be very problematic when you're looking at um, blossom time and pollination and frost. So we had a hard frost on June 1st, where I live this year. It was a hard frost. We went down to 31. And we had lots of um, little tiny developing apples, very small, um, that, that took a beating. Um, and that's one of the reasons why this year is not going to be as, nearly as good as last year. Is this the new norm, this biennialism? I, yeah, it's my wild ass guess is, yeah, I, I think it is um, the new norm. And what it means for us is in order to manage this uh, climate change and the extremes that we're having, from an apple grower's perspective, it, it means you, you need to really prune and thin more heavily than usual to try to uh, counteract the, uh, the biennialism trend. 
So the, the first module that I want to get into, the first learning module is where is the best place for apple trees? And I would encourage you to put it, if you can, in a place that gets a lot of airflow. For example, this is our orchard, well, a little part of it, and some of the younger trees. And um, I purposely put it in a place that gets a lot of airflow. It's a windy site. Um, there's much less disease pressure when you have good airflow. And uh, it's on a little bit of a plateau. And because of that, the frost, frost goes into hollows. Um, you know, frost occurs um, when you have good radiational cooling conditions and um, you have no wind and the, the frost, the, the cold air will then settle in its frost pockets. So it, the, as much as you can put it in a flat plateau with airflow, the better. And there's actually a longer growing season in those environments. Um, to keep deer pressure down. So deer love uh, to nibble on apples. They, they really, it's, it's really tasty. Um, Another thing I decided to do was put the apple trees where there was the least amount of deer pressure possible. Um, and for us, that was um, near, near a road. Not that there isn't deer pressure there, but it's a little bit less than it would be if it was somewhere else. This I learned very quickly. Um, so our, our orchard, our main orchard, is right across from the house, you can to the left of that horse trailer there, you can, you can see some of the trees and it, it extends down further to the left. And every time I walk out of the house, I see that orchard. So what you see is what you get, right? You know, we, we've all heard that saying, uh, it's very important in my experience to have your apple trees be part of your daily visual intake to have it become part of your consciousness. Because <laughs> I also planted a lot of apple trees on a side hill um, in back of our house that was not within view of the house. It was out of sight. And you know what they say, out of sight, out of mind. It wasn't in my consciousness. Um, I originally planted about 40 apple trees on this hillside. And there's, oh, out of those 40 apple trees, I would say there's uh, maybe about 10 of them left, um, maybe 12. So I learned a lesson. And, and that's have the apple trees be, be part of your, your, your daily visual processing and you'll have a better connection with them. You'll pay closer attention to them. You're gonna go out and look for pests. You're gonna look for fungal disease. Um, I, I think they enjoy the, the, the connection. So I, I kind of gone over this. So what, what not to do is put them in a place where you're not going to be visiting them. And uh, the hillside, from a, an airflow perspective, a hillside, if it's not too steep, is a very good site from an airflow perspective. But if, this, if the slope is too steep, it just gets very hard to manage. So this is what worked for us in terms of site selection. Okay, are there any questions about site selection? Or anybody want to share any of their own experiences when it comes to site selection? I don't have any questions, so I think you might have been thorough, Jack, but let's keep let's keep moving. <laughs> you, know, you want to put a tree in the ground. Let's talk about preparation and planting. And I'm going to give you best case scenario, what the ideal is, and understand that you don't have to do it exactly this way, but if you follow these principles, you're going to have success. Okay, I got this from Fedco and I tried it and it works well. So this is something you would do in the fall to prepare for April planting. April is the very best time to plant apple trees. Um, except if you're in Maine and maybe it's gonna be early May, but for most of us, it would be April. So without digging the hole and 
uh, let's say uh, October, good time to do that, he would use this recipe from Fedco. And it, it does work well. I've used the recipe. Um, when push comes to shove, if you couldn't get a hold of all of those things, if you just put down the line or the, the gypsum or the line, the first bullet, and the third bullet, the third bullet, which is azomite, just those two things and lots of compost and put that in um, you know, a mound about four to six feet in diameter, a few inches deep with the compost, then that April, that's gonna break down and you're gonna have a wonderful environment to dig into and then incorporate uh, what hasn't been incorporated already into your soil. And then this is the, this is the magic. So it, it, go to some hardwood trees, especially if you have any wild apple trees on your property that you know, might be the, uh, you know, where, where a deer decided to let go of apple seeds that they had eaten and it becomes these wild apple trees. Well, there is some, I call it fungally dominant goodness under those trees. You know, get in there with a shovel and get some of that fungally dominated soil because it is magic for your apple trees and then mix that in to your planting hole. That's what I'm doing there. You know, mix it right in and the combination between your preparation in the fall, if you were able to do it, um, some good compost that is low in nitrogen. That's critical, low in nitrogen. Apple trees do not like a lot of nitrogen. And um, what you got from underneath the hardwood trees, you're gonna be good to go. So that's me planting a tree in the hole. When you get a tree from, let's say, Fedco or wherever you get it, and I'll talk about some sources, um, usually you'll see the, the roots are in layers. Um, you might typically have two or three layers of roots. So what you wanna do is tamp down the soil around each layer to minimize the amount of air pockets. This is a, a great way to do it as well, e either in the fall um, or as you're, you're planting, is to get some cardboard and put it around the tree. And if you do that in the fall, um, it'll help kill any turf, any grass. And uh, if you just wait until spring to do it and you put everything on top of that cardboard, um, you're gonna minimize weed pressure for that first growing season. And um, it, it's, it's good to put a stake in. Um, I have found that it helps and we have a pretty windy site. And uh, I always put a stake in, in immediately, right at the same time that I'm planting a, a new apple tree. And it's good when you plant the new apple tr trees to start off with spreading the limbs, or the, the limbs at, the, at that point, they're, you know, they're just tiny little branches but just uh, spread them to be a little bit more horizontal than vertical so that you're immediately beginning to change the, horm the hormonal balance from producing vertical growth to producing more fruit friendly uh, horizontal growth at 45 degree angles is, is ideal. Let's say 45 to 75 degrees is a, is a, a good angle. Okay, any questions at all on planting apple trees or from your own experience? Anybody have any, uh, any secrets that you want to share? I, I have a question uh, about the spreading. Um, what do you use to, how do you create your little spreaders? What, what are those physically? Okay. That you so I got those from um, Oesco, O-E-S-C-O, uh, you can also, you can get them on Amazon. They're called limb spreaders. Uh, Oesco is a company out of Conway, Massachusetts that has everything imaginable that, uh, when it comes to apple trees. 
they have all the stuff. But you could you, know, you can get it online as well. But Oresco's they're they're a good company to do business with. So they're called limb spreaders. You can get so those are aluminum limb spreaders, or you can also get uh, plastic ones, or um, you can even use uh, clothespins. Clothespins are not quite as effective, but they, they do work. That was a very good question. Thank you for that question. <clears throat> I have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, I, you kind of lost me back there when you were building the pile um, in the fall. Is there a hole under the pile and you're putting the pile of amendments on top of the, the cardboard on top of a hole or are you just planting the whole tree into this pile of amendments in the spring? So in the fall, um, it's, not on a hole, so I haven't dug the hole yet. So that pile um, is either on cardboard or just on the ground. And then in the spring, um, I'm creating the hole in the spring, incorporating uh, what was in that pile um, into the soil. And if it's on the cardboard, it's, um, it's, it's really killed the turf well. So yep, so the hole is dug in the spring. The fall preparation is just on the ground. And what is the size of the hole? Uh, I'm pretty big. So, you know, between four and six feet in diameter. So pretty, it's a, a pretty good size area because you, you want to make sure that those roots don't go from this very nice compost to where I live, heavy clay, um, too quickly. So you want to make sure that hole is... You know, you, see, so you, you're putting a 25-hour tree in a 100-hour hole. That's what you're doing. And how deep is it? Um, uh, at its deepest point, and it tapers off to the sides, at the deepest point, I would say 12 to 18 inches at the very deepest. It, it also depends upon the size of the tree that you bought. Um, it just... You want to make sure that the root system easily fits into the hole with a, a good five or six in, in, inches below the bottom of that root system. So it's going to depend upon whether or not you've got a, a one-year-old, two-year-old, even maybe a three-year-old uh, transplant that you're planting. Thank you. You're welcome. Good, very good question. Thank you for the question. Okay, this is the, my, my favorite part of the presentation. Uh, I am a car carrying member of Apple Addicts Anonymous and this select group. So you, we're all addicted to different varieties of apple trees. And the, the more you read and hear about apple trees, the more different varieties you want. So let me share with you my top 10. And those are the, the bullets on that slide correspond to the variables that I think about when, when I think about top 10. You know, your top 10 might be, might have a different set of variables. Okay, pristine. I mentioned this one already. Gorgeous lemon yellow apple. Um, it is mid to late August. For me, it's around August 15th to 20th. Um, it is not only a good taster, and a lot of early apples to me really don't taste that good, or they just don't taste like anything much at all. This one does, and it keeps for a couple of months. So everybody, y'all need to get a pristine and it has scab resistance. Get a pristine. So um, Jack, where, yes, where are you buying your trees? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna get into that. I do have some favorite places. Great. Um, and this part of the presentation, would it be okay to, to wait yeah. until we get to that part? Is that okay? No problem. Thank right. you. Thank you. So Zabergau Rene, um, it's a German apple. And it has this, a tremendous specific gravity. Um, it's really heavy, it weighs a lot. Um, my daughter loves that apple, but I do as well. It has unique flavor. And because of how dense it is, um, insects have a harder time uh, getting into it. Like the apple maggot uh, has a hard time getting into it. Uh, the Westfield seed no further. So this is a classic 
old New England variety developed in Westfield, Massachusetts in the early 1800s. And um, those folks in Westfield, uh, Mass, they developed a, a really nice apple. Um, not a great cooker, but just great right off the tree. Great fresh eating. Okay, four more. The mother. So another old Massachusetts variety, early 1800s. Uh, unique flavor. This was one of Queen Victoria's favorite apples. I don't know where she heard about it or had it first, but she would have mother apples shipped over from Boston. Um, to her, it, it, it was better than, uh, better than apples in England, in merry old England, which says a lot because they have some really great old varieties of apples in, in England that go back to to Roman and, and uh, even Celtic times. The golden russet. Um, so, you know, being kind of a very uh, the traditional New Englander, I really value this around Thanksgiving. If, if you go to, if you go to orchards around uh, early mid-November, you're going to see this cider. You're going to see it. The golden russet apple, is the best single varietal cider that you can ever have. So you can make cider just from this variety and very popular uh, here in New England for uh, Thanksgiving uh, cider, the Golden Russet. The Gold Rush I mentioned previously, the Gold Rush apple, it's related, it's a, an offshoot of Golden Delicious, except it has more disease resistance. It comes into maturity late, so let's say late October, um, you know, even as late as Halloween. And it, uh, it has a wonderful balance of, of sugar and acid, and it's very crisp, very nice apple. Okay, Liberty, the best disease-resistant apple um, I've ever grown. Um, it does a great job of being resistant to uh, cedar apple rust, um, uh, haven't had blight, um, scab, never have had scab on this apple, which is, it always looks good. And it makes great cider as well as fresh eating. And it was uh, developed, I think, in the 60s. And then my last three in the top 10. Okay, Crimson Crisp, a newer variety from the, uh, I think from the 90s. I don't think it's even 20 years old. May maybe 20 to 30 in the 90s. Uh, it, it has this, it's a gorgeous apple. It's extremely crisp, as its name indicates. Really nice, rich flavor. It has a spicy, it almost has a, a, a cinnamon, ginger. You know, when I bite into it, I think, oh my God, this is like apple pie. I'm, I'm having apple pie and it's resistant to scab. So you got to grow this one too. And uh, the John Gold two incredible parents, a Jonathan and a Golden Delicious mate, and you get a John of Gold, uh, man, that has it all. Great for pies, great for eating, right off the tree. It, it really did inherit the best of its, of its parents. And then one of the most unique flavors, and almost, it almost tastes like a pear, is Hudson's Golden Gem. Um, it, it, it has, the color of a pear, and it, it, it's, it tastes like a cross between an apple and, and a pear, almost like a nutty flavor, um, very unique. Uh, anybody that I give this apple to say, whoa, huh, I've never had an apple that tastes anything like this. So you gotta get that one too. So anyway, so those are 10 musts. Okay, here's the sources for, I think maybe that was Nikisa with the sources question. There, so there's, there's lots of great places to get apple trees. These are four that I've had great luck with. Um, and I wanna talk about another one too that uh, I'm, I'm not so sure he's selling apple trees right now though. So Fedco, um, Stock Brothers, Trees of Antiquity out of California. Cummins Nursery is out of uh, New York State up by uh, Finger Lakes region, up by Cornell. Um, there are some local nurseries that will stock apple trees. And I've gotten a couple from some local nurseries. There's one in New Hampshire that I got a New Hampshire variety called 
Hampshire uh, from, but those four have worked for me. They have very high quality. Um, Fedco and Cummins Nursery has a lot of variety. Cummins has hundreds, at least a couple hundred different varieties. So, you know, where do you get trees from? And I would recommend these in St. Lawrence Nursery. Um, I don't know if Bill McKinley uh, is still doing apple trees, but that was another place where I, I got some. You can also get scion wood from anyone that has an orchard in March when they have pruned their trees, like me, and they will give you scion wood. I give it away. And you could take a root stock that you could get really cheaply. You can buy root stock, by the way, from Fedco or Cummins Nursery. They both sell it. And, and uh, do your own, do your own trees. Uh, it's an inexpensive way of doing it as well. Um, or you could take an existing apple tree and graft onto it. Now I'm going to show you what that looks like um, in a bit. And uh, there's wonderful workshops on grafting um, apple trees in usually in March or April um, in, in, with all the NOFAs. Uh, I know North New Hampshire, we would do it, et cetera. And then rootstocks. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the details here, but you can get various size rootstocks to graft sign wood to, or you can choose your tree. So for example, Cummins Nursery might have, um, let's say Hudson's Golden Gem, and you can choose what rootstock you want. Do you want to have a really small tree? That's an M27 or an M9. Do you want to have a, a much larger tree? You know, which would be, uh, let's say an, an, M, an M25, an MM103, you know, 90%. So you can choose rootstock uh, depending upon how big you want your tree, so from very dwarf to dwarf to semi-dwarf to pretty big to really big. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, Cummins Nursery has a very large selection of different rootstocks you can choose. Um, those are some personal favorites of mine. I'm not going to go through in, in a lot of uh, detail, but you can see which, which ones I've had some really good success with. And uh, even Fedco uh, and other places like Stark Brothers, uh, Trees of Antiquity, they'll let you know um, if there is variety in their rootstocks uh, where you could choose, or they'll tell you what rootstock they're using. Okay, any questions on particularly the, the 10 varieties, or, or just varieties in general, before I get into this next learning module? I, I think there have been some questions. So, um, Christine, do you want to ask your question? Um, I've been uh, working with Golden Russet and Roxbury Russet. Um, I work with apple trees at Old Sturbridge Village, and I've found that both of those are also very insect and disease resistant. Um, we don't spray trees within the village because of our historic practices. And I'm assuming that that may be because of the coarse skin on the apple. And I was wondering if that, uh, if you find that to be the case um, with the, the apples that you've raised, the russet varieties. Yeah, it, it helps. So I, I have uh, a, few, a few different russet varieties and they definitely do not have as much um, of the, the apple maggot pressure. You know, they have some curculio. I'll get into that, but not as much apple maggot pressure. So uh, I would tend to agree that the, the, the skin uh, has something to do with, with that. Um, so do you, do you make a cider out of the golden russet? Do you do a single varietal cider? Um, at the, at Sturbridge Village, we press, we don't do a single variety cider. We press a whole host of apples all together. But I always buy every year at Thanksgiving. I buy golden russet cider in um, in Bolton, Massachusetts. Uh, we go there on a pilgrimage to get it for Thanksgiving, and I agree with you; it's the best. It is absolutely <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, the same way. I'm the same way. I, I I can't imagine a Thanksgiving without some golden russet on the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So uh, thank, thanks for that. Yeah. 
Um, this is Sarah. I had a question back at the planting uh, uh, presentation. Um, is it important to keep the pasture around your trees mown? Um, I don't have a gravely and I have my apples in kind of a meadow and I've done a lot of weeding to take um, invasive species out, but I still have, you know, clover and mustard and wildflowers and they get pretty big, some of the, the plants in there. Is that okay to allow the tree, you know, my trees are two and a half years old, they're bigger than the, than the meadow, but it's a robust meadow. Some of the, some of the plants are six to eight feet tall. I mean, some of them get the black eyed Susan and stuff get pretty big. So it was, um, I'm sorry, was that Susan? That's Sarah, Sarah and I'm just trying to figure yeah. out whether I need to invest yeah. in something to mow okay. my orchard with. <laughs> no, Sarah, that, that is a, it's an excellent question because it's something that we all run into and I'm going to talk about um, maintaining as much diversity as you possibly can um, in and around your orchard. So my answer for you would be keep that um, diversity in that meadow going as much as you can. However, I would give a, a 10 foot radius around the younger apple trees. And they're still pretty young. You said two or three years old. They're, they're, yeah. they're youngins. About a 10 foot radius around each apple tree where you mow it um, around the time of the summer solstice. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to keep it a golf course. You know, you know, mow it around the time of the solstice and then mow it again mid to late August. And, and that's all I would do. That's yeah, I rent a gravely and I mow everything in the fall. And then I just weed whack around them uh, in the in the early summer. So That's I think fine. I'm kind of following your advice You're more fine. or less. Summer solstice, I'll make a note of that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah cuz the rhythm the rhythm changes with the the, the solstice. A lot, a lot happens underground with the solstice. So, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, low maintenance. You know, no one wants to spend 16 hours a day, seven days a week, anywhere, even if you love your orchard. So some low maintenance tips is to, and this is homestead orchard now, so you know, you're not in this to make a million bucks, is to prune to eventually get to only one or two um, levels of scaffold limbs, just two levels. And lower the height of the top of your tree to be more manageable so that you're not dealing with ladders when you go to spray. So prune where you only have a couple of growing levels or if you will, scaffolds. Manage the height. Make sure between your major limbs, you've got a lot of space. Give yourself room to get in there. And the old saying was, you should be able to throw the family cow in between the space of the limbs. But, you know, uh, <laughs> that's an exaggeration. You know, maybe a baseball cap. I, I think that would be that would be enough. So why are you doing this? You're doing it for low maintenance. You're also doing it to maximize light, airflow, and space. It's going to reduce fungal pressure, and it's going to increase the quality of the apples. And it's the same with thinning in June. You know, thin, thin, thin. So let's say you have really good pollination, and you have seven blossoms in a cluster, and every one of those blossoms gets pollinated. Well, in the middle of that cluster, you have the king blossom. And that king blossom is the one you want to keep. That, that little apple in the middle. All the other apples, take them off. If you want to maximize quality, you're, you're going to get a lot of fruit. And it, when apples rub up against one another, they're much more prone to be a, a safe haven for insects that want to do your apples harm. So thin with extreme prejudice. 
And okay, so uh, I think it was Sarah asked this question. Yeah, um, you don't want to mow around the apple trees like it's a golf course. Um, you know, I use uh, you know wood chip mulch around my drip line. I use old hay bales. Um, I'm using things to encourage, and I'll get into this, a fungally dominant environment. And I don't mow anything uh, at all, even pretty, even really close to the trees until uh, the summer solstice. That's when I go in, you know, I mean, give or take. Jack? Yes. I had another question. This is Sarah. Um, I, I was top dressing because I have a big supply of old horse manure. And I was spreading horse manure around the drip line in the fall just to kind of mulch everything down. Is uh -huh. that too rich in nitrogen or is that okay? It's, it's pretty aged. Okay. Um, it, is it, I, I, I've done that. So, so Sarah, I did exactly what you did um, when I first planted quite a few trees. And what I learned um, from people that, like Michael Phillips, who, you know, for, for me, Michael Phillips is a center of profound knowledge on all of this stuff. Get his books, buy his books okay. on, um, uh, on holistic uh, apple orchard. It, unless that manure is so well aged and composted that it begins to take on less bacterial and more fungal characteristics, it's going to invite insect pressure. Is there a way you could combine your uh, manure with things like wood chips or old yep, hay? Yep, or old I hay? can. I mean, it's pretty that. wormy. It's, does that mean that it's still got a lot of bacteria? Oh yeah, oh good, yep, yep. Okay. Yep, good. And, and you know, fungal, you know, worms will create more of the environment to make sure that, that manure is broken down and okay. the wood chips and All the right, I'll make the wood chips. Yeah. Thank you. Good, 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 good. Uh, okay, there's a lot of pests that want to minimize the quality and the nutrient density of your apples. Now, if you didn't spray a thing, you'd still get apples. Um, if you prune well, if you thin well, you're going to get apples. But if you don't deal with the pests, the apples just aren't gonna have the same flavor profile. They're not gonna be as good, and they might be not nearly as good. So you've gotta do some things to make peace with pests. So one of the things I use is, it's a kaolin clay product that's called Surround. And uh, you can get this uh, probably at any of the, the NOFA bulk orders. That's where I've gotten mine from Milton, New Hampshire, uh, bulk order. I know Milton Mass has the, has the same, they have surround. And you, you mix about three cups of it with um, a gallon of water and you, you do it in, a, in like a, a, a big bucket and stir it really well, really well. And then you put it in your backpack sprayer and you want to spray that surround right after um, the, uh, the blossom fall. So when, when the blossoms fall off the tree, that's when you want to spray surround because as soon as the blossoms fall, the plum curculio that is all around where you live, um, in and around your orchard, it, it loves to harbor uh, or overwinter in in hardwood forests, it will come screaming into your orchard and begin to lay its, its eggs on the very beginnings of your little baby apples that are like that big. So you surround. The other thing that you should do, especially with trees that are less than five years old, is get diatomaceous earth and rub it on the bottom six to 12 inches of the trunk of your little, or of your young trees, and right at the base of the tree where it intersects with your soil, or your, um, your wood chips or your, your, your gravel mulch, because it'll discourage round-headed apple tree borer. Round-headed apple tree borer will easily 
Um, get into your young trees between newly planted and three years old. It'll get in there at the intersection of soil and uh, the trunk. It'll eat the cambium layer and it'll kill your tree. I have lost uh, maybe 15 trees over the years, young trees, to round-headed apple tree borer. Use diatomaceous earth. Uh, as the trees are more than five years old, um, you, you don't have to go to this trouble, especially more than seven or eight years old then. You're not gonna have to worry about it. Okay. I, I mentioned grafting. I'm not going to go, the, grafting is a workshop in and of itself. It, it's actually like a half a day hands-on workshop, but I just want to let you know this. If you have inherited uh, some old apple trees, then you want to go to someone and say, you know, do you mind if I help you prune your trees? And by the way, can I have some of your um, prunings? And that's cyan wood. And then you take that cyan wood. Uh, and I got some cyan wood here. This is a Gano. Um, it's going to be, and it is now, a Gano apple. This is a couple years old photo. I got this from Canterbury Shaker Village in um, Canterbury, uh, New Hampshire. So what you do is you, you take that cyan wood and you graft it into the cambium layer of an existing limb and as long as those cambium layers meet then uh, you're going to have a gano limb that limb is going to produce gano apples makes no no difference at all what that apple tree's limb originally was producing you're going to have gano apples on, on that limb so uh you know, volunteer to do a little bit of pruning or just ask someone that you know that has apple trees and you know, they'll, they'll gladly give you some one-year-old sign with YouTube. Um, YouTube has some wonderful videos on how to graft an apple tree. But there's also hands-on workshops every, every, every late winter and every NOFA. So this is another example. Look at how much that graft grew in one, that was one year, one year. Because you're getting all that energy through that wind system. And all that energy is going to be going to make that, that graft grow very quickly. You could get fruit. I've had some fruit in two years. Definitely in three years, I've had fruit from a graft. Okay, so any questions on either grafting or uh, anything up to this point? Any questions? I've, I've got more to go over, but I'm, this is a good place to stop. In the pest category, um, I have a terrible time with meadow voles eating the root systems. Oh, yes. Young yes. Any suggestions for that? Yeah, the tree guards. Okay, so my, my trees are big enough now, but when they weren't big enough, um, I went ahead and uh, I was looking at a catalog because I've had this recommended to me. And I bought some tree guards. They're, they're plastic tree guards yep. that come in two sections and you put them together you make sure you really get them into the ground, really into the ground, and, and then clean the area around where those tree guards are because the voles and the mice, um, they don't like to have a lot of open space. So, so clean that area right around the tree, put the tree guards in, um, at least until the trees are five years old. Uh, th that'll help if you have a lot of vole damage or voles and we, we all do you know we, we all have those mice my my bowl damage is underground and what they do they can't is, breathe they can they, eat the roots yeah, yeah they, they, they can eat the roots problem. they can't that, that hasn't happened to me luckily but i i've had mole damage um where they tried to um you know go around the bark and eat the cambium layer so so for that one of the things that 
they don't like is packed in snow. So in, in the winter time, if, if you've got a snow cover, if you you know get some snowshoes or just with, with boots, if you really pack down that snow around the apple trees, um, I found that voles don't like that environment. They they like to have kind of a you know a, a free uh, an easy tunnel passage. So yeah, it, it is a problem. So uh, as, as much as you can make uh, an environment that isn't as, as friendly and send them, off, send them off somewhere else. Um, Jack, this is Sarah again. Um, I've used copper uh, sulfate spray for some leaf curl that I have two peach trees and my peach trees get leaf curl. Um, but then someone told me it might be bad for the pollinators. So do you, do you have an opinion on the use of copper sulfate as an early season? I do it after my dormant oil in the early spring to try and uh, prevent the leaf curl. On, on your apple, on apple trees? Well, I sprayed them all because I wasn't sure if it was contagious. <laughs> so yeah. I, uh, um, you know, for apple trees, I have used the dormant oil spray um, yeah. to kill any overwintering eggs. And, and I haven't even done that every year, um, just maybe every other year. And for, for apple disease, uh, I would recommend going with um, neem oil. Yep, I use that too. And I have found that to be okay. So, you know, make knock on wood. Um, I have found that that helps a lot. If, yeah. if I use the neem oil about every 10 days in the um, in, in that early, the early part of the growing season, that that does help. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I, I mentioned this already. I'm looking at the time here. So, okay, so we've got a, a half an hour. Yeah. Establishing fungal dominance. Your apple trees don't like the same things your tomato plants or your pumpkins like. That's bacterial dominance. So they like fungal dominance. And what does that mean? It means, if you look at that third bullet, wood chips. Wood chips are gold. Um, prunings, um, you know, huger culture. Anything that helps to create an environment like the edge of, the, of a forest. Apple trees originated in the area in, in around what is now Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, and Central and South Central Asia. And they, they originated at the edge of and in, in a forest environment. And so they still have that genetic memory. So you want to try to recreate the edge of the forest in your orchard, or if you have a south facing, it can't be north facing, if you have a south facing edge of a tree line or a forest, and you're, you're confident that you can get enough sun in there, then you can plant apple trees right at the edge and they, they would have a good environment. The last bullet is, is important. So you get friendly with your local tree pruning company. And everybody has tree pruning companies um, in your area or a power company or get friendly with the local power company when they do uh, tree trimming. That's what I did about two or three years ago. They were trimming trees on our, our road. And um, I gave them, I, I, uh, was it maybe at 10, I don't even think it was $20 bill. I gave them a $10 bill and I said, you know, it's, it would be worth it to me if, if you guys, when you go back and forth after, uh, you know, cutting back the trees from the power lines, they're, they're clearing trees off the power lines, uh, to just dump everything right here. <laughs> I pointed to the place, you know, just dump it right here. And they did. They were excited. So, oh, yeah, great, great. You know, this will, you know, buy us our lunch down at the uh, general store. Great. So ma make peace with those companies and get as many wood chips as you can get. You can use them right away, but it's even better to let it cook for a while and, and mix 
of things that are more green, you know, mix things like um, if you have it, you know, animal manure or, you know, other green compost materials, mix that in with the wood chips and you are creating orchard compost. And even things like the prunings, you know, you're pruning your apple trees, save the prunings, get a chipper, rent a chipper, you know, chip it and then mix it in with compost and it makes for wonderful stuff so you know here's just a couple of piles from uh, this is a picture a few years ago from that um, from the power company just dumping all the stuff off and oh man it was it was good the other thing is i live in such a dry microclimate in the summer um, and i put these wood chip the, the wood chips in that the orchard compost i put it on thick because I'm gonna get a lot of rain in the summer and that really thick compost, whatever moisture I get uh, is, is kept. Um, it doesn't evaporate, it, it can't evaporate into the environment. So it's, and I don't know anybody else has a, a dry microclimate like I do, but um, you know, I, I have to do this. Okay, so we're talking about making your trees happy from a, a needs perspective. You know, how do you make your trees as, as, as rich as they can possibly uh, be in terms of uh, the, the nutrients and micronutrients? So I went over a lot of this already, but let me just reiterate that last bullet. So you don't want to put too much nitrogen into the soil or you don't want to feed your apple trees too much nitrogen. Okay, but they are going to need it, particularly in the first couple of years. So use slow release, and you know we're we're organic farmers, so we know we know all about slow release, right? Use slow release sources of nitrogen. So fish meal is a great one, or you know the orchard compost with animal manures that are broken down. As long as they're broken down. Is, is wonderful. You know, feather meal, probably the very first year, you know, feather meal has nitrogen, but it's, it's slow release. Phosphorus, okay, your apple trees, they also want phosphorus. Bone char is a wonderful source of phosphorus. You know, when, you're, when your trees start to get to the, the point where they're producing fruit, or just generally for root development, they want phosphorus, bone char, bone meal, colloidal phosphate. You can either get this, uh, get it from the NOFA bulk order in your chapter, you know, whatever uh, state you're from. Potassium, my favorite source of potassium is the second and third bullets. Um, so we burn a lot of wood in the winter. We have a couple wood stoves. Um, and I, I put that around my apple trees. Uh, all winter long and then we also have heavy clay and if you have and it's probably several of you that have a lot of clay in your soil then green sand you can get green sand out of a NOFA bulk order or you can you get it in a lot of different places but that that green sand is uh, great to to break up uh, heavy soil and then micronutrients uh, apple trees do require uh, micronutrients, uh, you know, humates, you know, wonderful source of micronutrients. And that third bullet there, you know, you, you once you get that fungal environment going after a few years, you know, once you get, um, however you've created that fungal environment, you know, using old hay bales, um, the wood chips, um, a lot of orchard diversity helps create that fungal environment. After that gets going, you could reduce the dependency on NPK. Um, I would still do micronutrients. So one of the best sources of micronutrients is azomite. And that is typically something every year uh, in the spring, even though my trees, a lot of them are 15 years old now, some of them even older. 
Uh, I'll, I'll put azomite and lime and calcium. I'll get into that in just a second. Um, in, in our neck of the woods here in the Northeast, it's almost as if you can't give too much calcium to your plants and apple trees need a lot of calcium. So what are some good sources of calcium? You know, there's a lot. Um, there's, you know, there, there's palletized lime. You can go with a, a dolomitic limestone, which um, if your area has, and if your soil has a magnesium deficiency, uh, dolomitic limestone covers off on calcium and magnesium. Um, gypsum is another great source of calcium. You know, think of, you know, you can buy gypsum really inexpensive, you know, in bags. You know, think of um, like sheetrock. That's what sheetrock is. <laughs> you have any old sheetrock lying around? Put it around your apple trees. It's, uh, it's calcium. Another thing that I like to use in my sprays is, um, is, is liquid seaweed. And you can, you can buy the kelp meal, um, which is a, a nice little source of nitrogen and potash. And then uh, uh, boron. They just, you just need a little bit of boron, but that's also uh, a micronutrient that they need. Okay, the third and fourth bullets. If you have sandy soil, then you want to make sure that you're getting some magnesium in there because it helps pull the soil particles closer together. If you have a lot of clay, then for sure you need to make sure you have a lot of calcium. And I would say even if you have sandy soil, you need calcium, but particularly if you have clay soil. And I mentioned that last bullet already. It's, it's, all, it's as if you can't really overdo calcium. Um, so, oops, hold on. Some final thoughts on soil fertility is, you know, get that soil food web fed by encouraging fungal dominance. That gets microbial action going. You're gonna give the apple tree all that it needs. Um, you don't have to use chemical fertilizers. Every year, some calcium, some azomite. If you have a good fungal boogie going around your trees, that's pretty much all you need from a soil fertility perspective. And they do need nitrogen, but you know, use the organic forms and, and use slow release because uh, you got to be careful with that. Okay, now how do you distribute soil fertility? So I talked about ways to do it where you know you're you're putting stuff around your plants, around the drip line. But uh, you're going to need to spray your apples. If you have one to ten trees, uh, a four or five gallon backpack sprayer is, is fine. Absolutely fine. If you want to spray surround, and I would recommend everyone to spray surround because it's about the only way to minimize pump curculio damage, then you need one with a diaphragm pump. The more trees you have, the more you need to think about getting either um, uh, a gas powered uh, Mr. Blower or getting a tow behind, a 25 gallon tow behind, and that'll, that'll save you a lot of time. And when I spray, this is generally what I'm putting in my sprays. I'm putting in liquid fish, liquid seaweed, um, sea minerals. And then in the summer, I'm doing a horsetail stinging metal. Um, I'm incorporating that, um, you know, letting and turning that into a tea. You know, getting horsetail, getting stinging metal, putting it into five gallon buckets putting a top on it, let it sit, it'll stink like hell, um, and then drain it, you know, put it through a, a filtration, and, and what's gonna come out, you put some of that, it's, it's homeopathic in a way, so it's not as if you can, you know, overdo it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, put a, a pint of that or so in a four gallon sprayer in the summer, and that helps with overall health. 
Um, Lancaster Ag makes a very good product called Fruit Mix. <coughs> they could also look into in, in garlic. Okay, so. Uh, okay, yeah, here we go. So I wanted to leave about 15 minutes or so for, for questions. And I'll make this presentation available to anyone that wants it. If you have my email right at the, the bottom of that slide, the last bullet, email me and I'll send you this, uh, this presentation. So time for questions. Come on guys, Any, don't be shy. Any last questions? Or even just sharing your own tips. I have a question on the uh, site selection. Uh, I have uh, two slopes uh, near my house that are possible locations. One faces east and one faces west. Is there any advantage to the direction that it would face? I would, yes, there is. Um, east. East. East, yep. Because west facing slopes can really cook in a hot summer and could potentially uh, take a lot of moisture out of the soil. Uh, east slopes aren't going to do that. Okay, and also could you say something about the spacing um, to allow for the trees? Um, how big do you want your trees? Do you want the semi-dwarf? The, the, the semi-dwarf semi is what I'm looking at getting. Uh, 20 to 25 feet okay. between trees for semi-dwarfs. And semi-dwarfs, uh, that, that was my uh, selection as well. Most of my trees are semi-dwarf and they're, they're plenty size. They're, they're good size. They're, they're not tiny trees. And if you were to get larger ones, the standards, would how, how much spacing would you need? The way I do it is I would only give them 25 feet, maybe five feet more because, and I do have uh, five or six standards, uh, because I prune them to be the same exact size as the semi dwarfs. Okay. So you, you can manage a standard to be a semi dwarf size. Uh, just by your pruning techniques, but I, I do give them another five feet, but not not a lot more. Okay, and the um, the the tea that you're making out of uh, horsetail and nettle um, is that what is the proportion for that? Are you using dry herb or fresh herb, or what are you doing? Yep. So we we've got a lot of both on our farm. Um, so I'll cut it after the solstice, usually uh, early July, I'll cut the nettle and I'll pack it into a five gallon bucket. I'll fill that five gallon bucket with water and let it sit for a couple weeks. And then all of the, the nutrients from the, from the nettle goes into the bucket. I'll take, you know, just the, uh, like a yogurt container. I'll take a yogurt container of that liquid after I filter, you know, after I filter it out, you know, take out all the, uh, the stinging metal, it's just liquid. About a, about a yogurt container, and then I'll put in a four gallon, my four gallon backpack sprayer. And I mix that in with the, the liquid fish and the liquid seaweed. And it's a, it's a very good spray uh, to keep summer diseases at bay. Um, the, the stinging nettle is, is good at reducing things like uh, fly speck or sooty blotch, which are those black blotches that you'll see on apples in the summer. And the horsetail? And the, the, the horsetail, uh, same thing. Same so thing. I'll take a, a yogurt cup and put it in there. And the horsetail, um, I, I find it's very synergistic with the uh, the stinging nettle, so I'll, I'll use both of them together. As I said, it's it's almost. I'm, I'm sure you could use a lot less, but it, I, I just have gotten used to using about a yogurt cupful. And and what do you do with the surplus? Do you keep it to? to I, I keep it. Yeah, 
I, I keep it so I can use it every seven days. And then what I'll do is I'll then take it, whatever's left over, I'll take it and I'll put it in my 25 gallon uh, tow around sprayer. And I'll actually spray, um, you know, other uh, uh, vegetables with it. So, you know, winter squash, pumpkins, tomatoes. Uh, it's, it's just good stuff. So I don't let it go to waste. Great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. D d d it's not going to harm your vegetables either. It'll help. All right. So any other questions? Please, anything. There's no stupid questions. They're all good. If no more questions, send me an email. I'll get you the presentation. Um, if you have any questions and you just want to ask them now, um, you can also include the questions in the email. The most important thing to remember is you don't have to be perfect. Um, you you want to just do things that create an environment where there's a lot of diversity around your trees, brings in beneficial insects. Do create a fungal environment around your trees right from the beginning. Get your trees off to a good start. And get a backpack sprayer, uh, a four gallon backpack sprayer. It's an investment. Um, the surround is the very best way to keep pump curculio away from biting every single one of your young apples. Um, works really well. And if that's all you did, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna get some decent apples. That's all you did. And, and get different varieties, make cider. Uh, the, the more varieties you use for your cider, the better it will be. Um, except for the for the golden russet. For the golden russet, you can just mix cider just with the golden russet in November. This is Christy. I, I thought of one other question I wanted to ask you. Do you uh, do any June pruning on your trees? I have been taught that if I prune too heavily in the spring, that it stimulates a lot of shoot growth that I don't want that it's better to wait for that heavier pruning and do it in June when the trees have started to fruit? Okay, so I prune twice. Um, so I prune in weather dependent, February or March, so I can get the shape of the tree, so I could immediately get better airflow. And then you will get a response, especially if you prune vigorously, you're gonna get a response of a lot of water sprout growth. And then I go in late July. I've done some of it already. I'll do more next week. I'll go in late July and take out a lot of the water sprouts. I'm gonna leave some because I'm gonna use some maybe for cyan wood that I'm gonna give away to friends, but I'm gonna, I'm going to do it again. So I'm, I'm going to take out those water spots. It, it's, they come off really easily. It's almost as if you don't even need uh, pruning shears. You can almost go in there and, you know, just, you know, take them off with your hand. It doesn't take long. So I do it twice. Because you're right. You will get a tremendous burst of growth when you prune uh, heavily in the late winter. If you don't prune heavily in late, late winter, though, Again, you're gonna be minimizing airflow. Um, I'm not about, I'm homestead, so I'm not about commercial production. I'd rather have a few great apples than lots of okay apples. And, and now is a good time to do that water stock pruning, late July, about a month after the solstice. Thank you. You're welcome. I have one more question about deer pressure. Uh, how how many years does it take before the trees are not really um, susceptible to deer pressure? Well, I have some trees where the lower scaffold is is under six feet, 
Um, I try to get it to about six or seven feet. And I've seen a little bit of deer pressure this year. Um, our best deterrent for deer pressure was an English shepherd dog. Get an English shepherd. <laughs> um, you know, she lived till she was 15. She passed away um, a year and a half ago. And that works wonders to get, get a farm dog. And the farm dog will know uh, what you want. And they will keep the deer away. Uh, Jessie kept deer away for years. She's gone now. We have two other dogs. <laughs> and they, they could care less about the deer. And uh, because of that, I get a little bit more deer pressure. Um, so certainly anything younger than a six or seven year old tree is gonna be susceptible to deer damage. The other thing is to put up an eight foot high fence, but uh, I don't know, that's, to me that's just, if you have to, you have to, but it's a lot of work. Okay. Okay, any other questions? You have five more minutes? Uh, Jack, I have a few little announcements. Please. No more questions. Please. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you all for joining us. Um, and thank you, Jack, for an inspiring and informative presentation. I think we all learned a bunch about tomatoes, uh, uh, apples. <laughs> and um, we're, we're, I think I'm, you know, I, for one, I, I'd already gone online and tried to see if I could buy some trees, but I realize now that I should wait until the spring. <laughs> so that's too bad. Um, but um, we'll be ready for a cider in the fall. I definitely, that was fantastic. Okay, well, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, it was a lot of fun and um, happy apple eating. <laughs> yes, bye-bye everybody. Thank you for your participation and questions. And Nigisa, uh, thanks for hosting. Good job. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.